have a fantastic day planned for sure, but we're going to start off with a fantastic talk from Caroline Clark, and she is going to be talking to us about quantum communications and how we're going to move out, out of the lab <laughs> into technology. So take it away. It's, it, the floor is yours. Thanks. Is this working? Do I need to do anything else? Can everyone hear Just me? Need to. Yeah? Is that better? Yeah, I think he's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I was worried that I might be the scruffiest person here because I just always wear my trainers and then you spoke and it was like, yes. Um, that's, the one th that's the best thing for me about working in tech is I never have to go to work in a suit. And uh, even if I'm interviewing, I can just throw on my jacket and no one notices. Um, uh, I feel a little bit guilty about being in the tech track because my talk is not very techy. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, because I, I sort of committed to saying more than could fit into half an hour if I went really technical. But also, I'm a mechanical engineer and not a quantum physicist. So if I start to go down the quantum tech route too much, I get a bit out of my depth and I need to kind of pull myself back. So um, I'm going to keep well out of the way of that. Um, I've been working in quantum technology development for the past sort of five or six years now. Um, I've learned a lot of the vocab, but um, that's, as, that's as far as it gets. Previous to that, I was um, as a consultant in engineering. I worked in ultrasonics and uh, did signal processing. So I've got a completely different background to this kind of stuff. Um, I don't really get into that anymore, sadly. I manage people and money um, and our company. Uh, so you might say to yourself, well... Why have you come here to talk about quantum communications? What are quantum communications? I kind of, I feel a little bit of a fraud after your talks. I'm gonna say some of the same things that you did around, um, we live in this increasingly connected world. We transfer information from one place to another on a regular basis. We secure our financial information, medical records, and all sorts of other things. Um, we use encryption to do that. And uh, we, we've done that for many, many years, back to Roman times and beyond. Um, and the way we do that now is really, really good. So our stuff is mostly secure um, and occasionally it gets hacked, of course. Um, but it does rely on, on really hard maths um, and the fact that um, the computers that we have around today struggle to solve these really, really hard maths problems. Of course, these computers are getting faster and faster and hackers and, and uh, threat actors or whatever you want to call them are becoming more and more sophisticated. So there will still be threats in the future. And one of the main things that's coming that is going to cause us a problem are quantum computers. So whilst we're a quantum company, we're not developing quantum computers, I should say. Um, I have some former colleagues out in the States who are doing that sort of stuff, and they've raised a shed load of money to do it. Um, Google, others, um, many, many, many startups around the world are, are raising hundreds of millions of dollars and pounds to build quantum computers. There are differing views as to when they'll actually be here and when there will actually be a problem for us, but it is getting nearer. And uh, within the next, let's say five to 10 years, someone will have built one that can break some of these hard maths problems. Um, I don't know uh, how much you know about these kind of things, so I'm gonna go with the basic level of um, computers that we have today solve problems in series, so they're gonna try an answer, it doesn't work, I'm gonna try another one, and try another one and another one. So it takes quite a long time to try many, many answers. A quantum computer uh, processes information using qubits, which are ones and zeros at the same time, blows your mind. Uh, um, they can therefore um, process information in parallel. So all of that stuff that I would have to do in series, they can do all at once. So they can break stuff much faster. But then what do you do once someone's got that, and they can break our even, you know, the, our most secure encryption. Do we just not send stuff? Do we go back to some sort of dark age where we send pigeons and we send letters across the Atlantic and all that kind of stuff? Well, you'd hope not. So there are companies like ours and others that are trying to um, kind of get ahead, I suppose, and solve these problems and thinking about how we might solve them in the future. Um, and that's where our company Kets comes in. We're um, a startup. Uh, we spun out of the University of Bristol, although technically we're a startup and not a spin out. University contracts related difficulties. Um, uh, we, uh, we're developing hardware solutions. We started off three years ago um, with a, a, an iCure program. Um, we did a lot of basic marketing through that. We, we were really lucky and we won the University New Enterprise Competition. 
um, which gave us a little bit of cash and uh, membership of Set Squared, which of course you have down here next to as well. And it's a superb organization for getting stuff out of universities and commercializing it. Um, we got a little bit of money from a contract. And so we sort of got cracking. Um, there were four of us for a, a long time in the company until last year when we raised um, some investment. We had around uh, two million pounds, a mixture of equity investment and Innovate UK R&D funding to kind of start getting our stuff moving. And that's, that's kind of who we are. Um, and we're primarily developing hardware solutions. So there are two trains of thought with, with uh, quantum communications in terms of fighting this quantum threat. One is you build hardware and you install that in all of your infrastructure and, and solve it that way. Or the other, cheaper, of course, is you build software solutions, algorithms. People call these post-quantum algorithms. And uh, actually what we think is there's probably some kind of combined solution. So whilst we're developing hardware now, um, we're talking to post-quantum companies and partners who can work with us so that we develop some sort of um, combined solution. And that's more likely to be what happens. But the challenge still is how you get it out of the lab. Um, the work that we do is based on um, 20 years worth of awesome research at the University of Bristol, um, taking huge um, lab-sized experiments and shrinking them down onto a single photonic chip, sort of size of my uh, little fingernail. Um, and that's kind of where we got to a couple of years ago. We had our chips. Um, you could have one over here and one over here. If you had a fiber optic connection between them, you could encrypt some information and send a secure key down them. We do that using um, single particles of light um, and we encode keys on them. Um, our challenge has been, how do you turn these two chips that are effectively on life support in a lab, um, hooked up to all sorts of electronic test and measurement equipment or control equipment and turning into something that kind of looks like a product, I suppose. Um, so like I said, we started off on that IQ program. We, we, we got a little bit of money from the University of Bristol. Um, we've raised a little bit of investment. We've sort of pulled together a team and actually one of the greatest challenges in terms of pulling together a team is finding the engineers that can work with our quantum folk and, uh, and uh, shrink a lot of that lab stuff onto something that looks more like something you and I would associate with being a product. Um, and it's expensive. Um, our chip looks, does this have a pointy thing? Oh yeah. This is one of our chips. Um, we're building, this is a, a quantum random number generator chip. So um, even the current encryption systems use random numbers, um, which are uh, created in many, many different ways, but we um, use uh, photonic systems to, uh, to create quantum random numbers, which are um, scientifically inherently um, random. Um, and uh, these are some of the pictures from our lab. Um, when, you've, when you've only got stuff in a lab with boards like this, you've got, it's really hard to find pretty pictures of what you do. Um, this, is our, well, this is one of our um, quantum QKD, quantum key distribution chips. That's the um, transmitter. Yeah, that's the transmitter chip. I think it's about um, three by one mil. Um, and that's kind of where we were about a year ago. We got money, we got people, we got time. And, uh, and then we're slowly make, turning into something that looks more like a product. Um, this is a, a, our QRNG system. And although these two clearly are renders, um, actually we just got that board back yesterday from uh, a great little company in Bristol called Cubic who do um, prototyping and uh, electronic um, systems. So they've, they've uh, populated the PCB for us. So, um, Great example of you know, collaborating, working with people that are local. Um, but yeah, that's come back now. And uh, we're now starting to move towards something that actually looks like a product rather than a lab-based experiment. How am I doing time-wise? Oh, super. Um, our, um, our QKD um, kit looks not, not dissimilar to this, but there are two of them rather than one. Um, we, we can't do it on our own. Um, as we know, that you have to partner and collaborate with lots of people. Um, and uh, some of the people that we're working with um, are BT, Airbus and Talis. We've, we've just completed an Innovate UK project with Airbus, ourselves, the University of Bristol, among others, um, to demonstrate this kind of technology from a drone to ground station. So whilst I said the, um, the comms link had to be fiber optic, actually it can be free space, so you can shine light as you can see through free space as long as you can pick up the single photons within that you can still do qkd um, that that was a really really successful um, partnership and ultimately the sort of things that airbus would want to see this used in our satellite applications and similar um, we're currently working with bt and a bunch of others 
<coughs> including um, Toshiba and uh, Dashboard, who are based here in Exeter, um, and, uh, and working um, with them on uh, more general applications for our um, QKD, um, looking at what end users might need, looking at the whole sort of chain, I guess, from people developing devices, people putting together what we're doing as our sort of systems, then BT looking at the network infrastructure and people like Dashboard, BP and others looking at how they might use it in the things that they build and supply to their customers. Um, most recently, we, um, we joined Talis on their um, Cyber at Station F program, which is based in, um, in Paris. They run a competition for small companies to join them. You go through, um, a, I think it's a nine month program, the first few months being working with them and working with their various um, global business units to come up with um, a project that you then take forward in the second half of the program. Um, so we're looking to work with them on securing things like um, hardware security modules or similar. Um, we're really lucky to work with these kind of partners because I think for, for us, from, from a, I did say I would talk about the challenges around um, developing this kind of company. We're new, we're young, um, we're, we're lacking resources in many ways. It's, uh, it's, it's becoming very clear to us that if we're going to be successful, we have to partner with someone like one of these big companies to take our products forward and, uh, and help us find the right customers. In terms of where we sit in the UK landscape, for us in particular, and now is a really, really good time. Um, the government invested 240 million in quantum technology development about five years ago. And that investment's kind of starting to come to fruition now. You've got companies like ours and similar sort of popping out of universities and starting to commercialize research. But they've now thrown some more money in, um, which has taken the total investment in quantum in the UK uh, to a billion. So that's a mixture of government investment and then industry match funding. Um, they're kind of churning out money via the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund at the minute, and there's um, a call out at the minute for projects for the next wave of funding. So for us, it's a particularly good time. It's also, yes, it's also a good time to be an entrepreneur in this kind of environment. Um, and th one of the reasons for that is because we live in the Southwest. Um, there are a lot of companies kind of starting off. Uh, this is probably out of date now, but there are a lot of companies starting up in, in quantum tech now and raising m obscene amounts of money. Um, unfortunately, not as much coming our way as we would have liked, but um, some of these are, are raising hundreds of millions of dollars for their seed investment round. But the Southwest is a good place to do this. Obviously, I've come from Bristol, and that's what I know. Um, but there's plenty of stuff going on down here in Exeter um, with the Set Square program, but there's quite a lot of work in the university on, um, on quantum comms and quantum, uh, sorry, quantum computing. Um, and Brist I know Bristol collaborates with folk down here as well. So the Southwest is a particularly good area in which to do this. Um, and Bristol in particular, I know about because it was a, I was working in this field before I moved into Ket. So I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on in this area to kind of inject some life and to grow this kind of ecosystem, which of course we say a lot, but you do need to have in order for these companies to um, appear and develop and grow and be successful. Um, and there's a whole collection of stuff going on um, at the University of Bristol in particular, um, which is um, creating this kind of um, pipeline, I guess, of, uh, of companies. Um, the, the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs, which is a, um, which is Ket Labs for short, this just looks like a, a whole wodge of um, acronyms, but this seems to be the field in which we work. There's acronyms everywhere. Um, once you break down the pieces, it's easy to see how you add all these things together to become um, a really nice ecosystem. You also have, of course, besides all of this stuff, things like Set Squared and Silicon Gorge and uh, South Wales Semiconductor people and uh, the cyber, cyber clusters that are around this area as well. If we break it down and I talk through maybe a couple of these things, um, there's the quantum engineering technology labs pulling all of this stuff together, but it consists of the quantum engineering CDT, which is the center for doctoral training, um, training uh, students in quantum engineering. So they don't just take physicists, they take engineers, they take um, uh, computer scientists, they take mathematicians, they spend a year um, as a cohort um, 
learning and the basics of quantum mechanics and and uh, uh, the various things that sort of kind of fit around that. And then they do their, their PhD project and that's now in its second set of funding actually. So there are probably 40 um, PhD qualified people wandering around now, um, popping out of that, sort of picking up the jobs that are appearing from these companies. Um, the thing that sort of started it all in Bristol was the Centre for Quantum Photonics, and uh, that was a collaboration between three or four academics who um, historically had done photonic-related research. They sort of started doing some quantum stuff, um, and uh, they brought together, I guess, some integrated knowledge and the quantum tech uh, knowledge, and then started doing things on chips. So they needed less space. Um, huh, maybe the university liked them because they didn't need as much lab space, but um, they took big, big um, optical table-based experiments and turned them into chips. And that was a really key thing for, um, for this. And that was, um, that was the thing that really spun all of the rest of this. Um, the quantum communications and quantum enhanced imaging hubs are part of the UK network. So there are four hubs around the country um, focused on different aspects of quantum technology. Bristol's a big part of both the communications hub and the imaging hub. There's also a quantum computing hub, which is based in Oxford, um, and a sensing hub, which is based in um, Birmingham. Uh, these hubs have just been refunded, actually. I think their funding starts again in December, so they're going to do another five years' worth of research, which in theory is focused on higher-level TRL stuff so that it can be spun out and turned into companies. This is, a, this, is a, this is one that quite a lot of people don't know about, and the Quantum Photonic Integrated Circuits Program. So the, this was a capital investment um, to create some, um, a sort of prototyping and uh, 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 chip development program within the university. So you get something quite quickly, quite fast, and you don't have to wait for a, a foundry for six months to produce your chip. But they could turn around um, a test piece quite quickly. Um, that's, that's up and running now, so if, uh, if anybody needs integrated photonic chips um, or they need help designing them to make them do quantum-related stuff, the university can, can help with that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's not just for um, universities, it's for commercial organisations and others, but um, they can do fast prototyping and packaging. Um, a more recent addition to this family of um, activity, QTech, I'm going to talk about a little bit in a in a minute, so I'm going to quickly skip that pass. But that's been um, that's been really helpful for Kets in terms of moving forwards. And then finally, um, the Quantum Technology Innovation Centre was something that's a more recent addition, and uh, I think it's about 50 million pounds of investment to build an accelerator in Bristol to bring a lot of these partner companies together, as well as the startups, to again just build that next bit of the ecosystem and that next bit of the story to allow these companies to scale and grow. It's all very well, them sort of spinning out and popping out, but where do they go next? Of course, we also want to keep them in the southwest and in Bristol. Um, they're sharing stuff with the university, and they've got a pilot program running now already in, uh, in a building in the center of town, and that's where off our office is based. We rent some office and lab space from them at the minute. Um, the idea of all of that, I guess, is that it adds up to some really high-skilled people, um, um, a pipeline for, for really good innovative research to kind of come through and turn into commercial um, opportunities. Um, and it also kind of, as it always does, it creates more opportunities for more funding for the people and the academics that are working in it. Um, but, you know, we've left that behind now. Um, and, uh, and we're doing the sort of thing that these companies that are going through the QTech program are doing. Um, QTech is a partnership between the university EPSRC and a bunch of other people, um, including um, Cranfield University. Um, the program started running in 2016. Um, our CTO, Phil, went through the program, I think that year actually, as one of the first fellows. Um, and the idea of the program is to take people who've done science degrees or similar, um, train them in business and entrepreneurship for a year. Um, they also get paid. This is quite unique about this thing. Um, you get paid about £28,000 to go through the programme. So you, you don't really have to make any sacrifices. It's win-win. Um, you um, get taken through various things as part of the programme. You learn about IP, you learn about business models, you learn about how to set up your company, um, you learn about um, 
raising capital investment. You do lots of pitch practice. Um, it's a sort of mini MBA for quantum people. Actually, and this year they've, um, they've started broadening that. Actually, they do pretty much any deep tech include, and bioscience. So you can almost be anything and get in this program at the minute. Um, they've got a gorgeous office right next to ours um, and free coffee and stuff. So you can't really complain. Um, it's really successful. They're, I think they're in one of their final cohorts that's funded through the, um, the EPSRC Engineering and Physical Sciences Council funded bit. Um, and then they're looking to privately fund it from now on um, and grow it into something more than it is now. But it's really successful and uh, um, they've spun out quite a few companies from it. Uh, some figures from them. There, there are, I think they've got about nine people in the program at the minute. They've already graduated about 11. Um, they've got a total of 17 companies that have been formed during it. Um, and those companies have raised a mixture of investment money, Innovate UK, R&D funding, um, and they've, of course, sold stuff to customers to the tune of about £11.5 million. The programme itself um, was about £4 million of investment from EPSRC, so um, they're doing pretty well. They've got about three times um, what, they, what came in now, so, and that number is going up. So in terms of return on investment, it's doing pretty well, um, and it's created 32 new jobs for not just Bristol, but there are some people kind of scattered around the country, and I think there's one guy who's set up in the, in the US. Um, there's, there's more to say on us and what's going on in Bristol and, uh, and I haven't particularly gone into much detail and I know I've skimmed the surface, but I, I wanted to give a, a, a sort of, a, I guess, a broad flavor of what's going on in Bristol, who we are and what we're doing. Um, if anybody wants to know in, any more of that stuff in detail, I'm around for all the day and very happy to sit and have coffee and chat to people about what we do or um, to, uh, equally by email. So we can do that. Um, I think I may be under my time, which has helped you catch up. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, maybe there's time for one or two questions. If yeah. Has Does them. anybody have any questions that they would like to ask, Caroline? If they can get the microphones to work this time. Uh, what proportion of the funding you're getting is... Uh, central government and government funds versus private equity? Ours is about half and half. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we, took, we, we raised our seed money last year, so we closed it all off in the summer, um, mm. and it was about half and half, and we will run out of money next summer. So we are looking now to, you know, how we put together a plan for the next lot of funding, and I suspect the ratio will be quite different at that point. Mm. Um, it might be more like uh, 10 to 1 in terms of, private investment versus the R&D, partly because we'll be more commercial at that point and we won't, be, we won't really have the resources to plow as much into the R&D stuff. But from the point of view of an early company, um, the Innovate UK money really helped us kind of bump up what we took from invest, investors. Um, <laughs> but it meant that we sort of, we almost plowed everything that we were doing into that. Um, and so there was nothing quite, there's nothing outside the grant, but now there'll be a lot more outside of it. And when do you launch your first product? Well, good question, good question. Um, and it depends on your definition of product, doesn't it, to a certain extent. Um, the, um, exactly. The, that render with the uh, QRNG, that product should be ready by the end of the year. But it's not necessarily uh, certified, gone through all kinds of beta testing product. It's something that we call a development kit. Um, so we could give it to... Um, BT or Adver or someone, and they could spend two weeks playing with it, testing it, and uh, I guess trying to break it, and then come back to us with feedback um, so we can modify it for the next one. So there's a period of trials to go through and a period of iteration, of course, and all of that, but um, then, uh, and that's just the one product, that's the QNG, which is perhaps simpler, um, but the full quantum key uh, encryption system would be April for that similar kind of level of development um, next year. And then perhaps two years of trialing, testing, iterating, certification stuff, two years after that. So what's that? Maybe three years, just under three years from now. Okay. Yeah. Who are the primary projected users of these dedicates that you're making? Uh, some of the companies that I throw, threw up up there. Um, so um, BT will are waiting for it, sort of just like, when is it ready? Um, Talis will no doubt have it and to play around with. We're talking to some um, cloud data providers in the US about putting it in and trialing it over there. 
um, which we, we, we really like. And actually, that could be one of our first customers. Um, we're also talking to another company in the US who secure some infrastructure for the US stock exchange. So that, but that, and that's with a financial um, end, I guess, end game. But they're, um, they're a bit like BT um, in the US. The telecoms in the US is a bit different to here. Um, but yeah, those people. Was there another question? I'll put them back. I was going to give you the microphone because you're a bit further away. So in terms of those... Oh, times, it's not even on. <laughs> but I can hear you. Okay. In terms of those timescales, um, at what point will the actual quantum computing... Oh, hello. Uh, quantum computing technology be in place to drive the demand for your, your products? It's a really good question. And it's, to a certain extent, an unknown. Um, we, we, I mean, it comes up in the press way more now than it did before, but the number stays the same often. It's sort of, I don't know, 10 years, and then a year later, it's still 10. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it could be 10, let's say 10. Um, there are some companies that are working in stealth mode as well that are not going to tell you when their stuff's going to be ready. Um, okay, absolutely. Um, so let's say 10 to 20. Then we've got a sort of wide enough um, error bars. Um, but uh, I guess one of the things that, um, that we're saying when we go out and talking to people, and this is a massive challenge for us because the threat that we're kind of trying to counter is not there yet, so it's really hard. Um, but if um, data harvesting goes on now already, so people can take your stuff and save it, and they could still wait until the, the quantum computer is ready and then unlock it. So it depends, for some people, it depends on what... Um, lifespan your security has to have as to how interested you are in terms of how far that is in the future. If you're a government, if you're the UK government and you want something to be secret for 25 years, well, if a quantum computer is coming in 15, you need it now. So it kind of, yeah, it depends. Thank you. Thank you very much.